So let's talk about setting expectations. And I'm going to describe to you what is inevitable with our new, beautiful, lush lawn that we just seeded or brought inside and put together. When we begin with a new lawn, we have a seed mix that's the varieties that we have chosen for the location we would like to have it. And it usually has a uniform color, it is lush, it looks wonderful, we love it. Over time, wind will bring in new seeds from the surrounding area, birds might do the same, and in addition there is something called a soil seed bank. That's all the weed and other seeds that's already in our native soil that is practically impossible to get rid of totally. They will become a part of the long mix. And the color may not be uniform anymore, and it may not be as lush and looking definitely different from how it was when it was new. So our choices are, as homeowner and gardener, one, to go with the mother nature. Mother nature has picked out the long seeds for you. And the eventual lawn, if you go with her, is called the climax lawn. That's how it's going to be best adapted for your side. Or we can fight Mother Nature. If we fight Mother Nature, it will take a lot of work, a lot of resources of time and money. And, um, and the really bad news is the best we can do is to slow the natural progression. We can never totally stop it. All right. So Climax Lawn, what does that look like? Well, it could look really good. These are gardens in Europe, different countries, and uh, most of these are public. Some, uh, one is private, and they all have a Climax Lawn. So if we do the right things in maintaining it, it can actually look pretty good and make our lives easier. So given that about expectations, I'll let you cogitate that a little bit. Let's meet some of the players. A very common seed uh, in the grass mixes in this, this area is the perennial rye. It is a tough grass. It looks great. Usually is used for parks, athletic fields, places that receive a lot of traffic. The downside of perennial rye is it loves nutrient. It has to be fed a lot. If there's not enough nitrogen for it to grow in a robust way, and water and sun, it will get sickly. It's, it, um, it's difficult to cure those illnesses. So it's more work and bad look. Fescue is another common grass seed that you can find in mixes. In fact, there are many kinds of fescue within the group, and they all behave slightly differently. So it's getting complex already. And Kentucky bluegrass, usually you'll see that show up in seed mix also, in probably small uh, percentages. The problem with Kentucky blue is it really likes to develop thatch. It has a propensity for doing that. So if you have Kentucky blue, a high ratio in the mix, then you have to dethatch often. So bent grass. Bent grass is the gladiator in the grass seed world. It is tough. It is competitive. It can do well with hardly any nutrient. It can adapt to all kinds of soil types. And it can do with little water. And in the summer, under drought, it will just become dormant. And then when the rain comes in the fall, it will bounce back. 
and the good news is bent grass seeds are likely already in your soil because it is perfectly adapted to our area. All right, so this is what happens. In the upper left corner is a new lawn that has put in and bent grass has started taking over. See the off-color patches? Okay, you probably have seen that if you've put in the new lawn. And then we progress to the upper right corner. The bent grass patch becomes bigger. And then we go to the lower right, it becomes even bigger. And finally, we get to the lower left, which is the climax lawn, which is bent grass dominated with other things, perhaps English daisy, perhaps yarrow, perhaps uh, clover, other types of uh, plants, and not just grass. So what's wrong with this lawn? Well, it's got lots of moss, it's got some bare patches, um, you know, and don't tell me it looks like your lawn. <laughs> I just made this one up. I can't tell you how much artistry it took. <laughs> so moss is a sign of not enough sun and too much standing water. So we can't, you know, we can kill it with the moss kill, but it'll come back if the condition does not change. So we have to think about the root of the problem and not just what we observe on the surface. How do we fix it? Improve drainage and make sure there is more sun. The bare patches, <laughs> easier said than done, I know. Yes. Now, the bare patches can be a lot of things. It could be disease last summer, it could be drought that had killed the grass and it's not the type that will bounce back. It could be soil compaction, too much walking, some equipment left there. Who knows what it is? So just by looking at the picture, we cannot tell. But I can give you the steps of how to fix a dead or a bad patch, all right? So let's just pretend your lawn is, you know, 90% good, but 10% maybe some problem, have problems. And we can use this step, uh, this approach to fix it. So the first thing is we have to remove the weeds. If you have persistent weeds like this dandelion that looks pretty awesome, doesn't it? Um, you've got to get the whole thing out and we recommend hand removal because that's the only way for you to know all the roots are out. And it's not going to be a surprise down the road after you've done all of the renovation work. And the second thing is to remove thatch. And I'll talk a little bit about what thatch is and why they build up. And after we remove the thatch, and our recommendation is if you just have a small patch, use a steel rake. Good exercise a little workout instead of going to the gym, and it does the job. And if you have a large area, you may want to use power equipment, like a dethatcher. Um, if the soil is compacted, then use a spading fork. See the picture in the lower right corner? That is my favorite gardening tool. It looks like a pitchfork, but it is a pitchfork on steroid. The tines are amazingly strong and much longer. It's the best way to aerate your soil and break up the clay. Okay, so if you don't have one, look into it and consider getting one. So the fork, just by poking it on the surface and making channels vertically down, there's no digging, no lifting the soil, can actually help aerate and lessen the compaction of the clay. And then we need to add organic material, probably yard debris, compost, or other kinds of compost, and uh, then we overseed. All right, so it's pretty easy. Get rid of the bad stuff, weeds and thatch. Improve the soil if it's compacted, add some organics, and then overseed, and then take good care of it. I know it sounds really easy. Probably a five minute job. So, so, renovating an old lawn. I see my neighbors with big patches of lawn that go through the progression of bent grass invasion, you know, off color patches. And then they get, they 
try all sorts of things and then they get frustrated and then finally they throw up their hands and say, ah, I'm going to have to start a new one. Well, the problem is, now we all know, when you start a new one, if you work really hard at keeping it from going toward the climax long, it could take as long as 10 years to get there. And by that time, you may be ready to move. So it's not your problem. But if you're not putting in all the right work and fertilizer and watering and mowing, it can get to the climax stage in two to three years. So then at that point, you may say, ah, oh, I have to put in a new one. So you might consider before putting in a new lawn some steps in renovating an old lawn. And there is an Oregon State publication on that, and the reference should be in the back of your handout. All right, so the way you renovate an old lawn is you look at the real problem patches and do the steps that we've just reviewed, and then you dethatch the entire lawn. That gives it a good start. And then follow the steps that I'm going to describe next in regular maintenance. So these are the aspects of how to maintain a lawn. All right, the first thing is mowing. Mowing is probably the most important in having a lawn look good and be healthy. Think of mowing as giving a haircut to the grass, right? So my son likes to grow his hair really long because he doesn't want to spend too much money at the hair place. So he'll go in after, with a really long hair and then try to get them to give him a buzz cut. And it is a shock. He may be a good looking guy, but that, quick, that drastic change is a big shock to my eyes. <laughs> Same thing with your lawn. Mowing should always be little clips. Think of it as trimming and not cutting. So don't wait until the grass is so deep and long and then, or high, and then go in and whack the heck out of it and cut it close to the ground. That is one of the worst things that we can do with mowing. Well, the mantra about mowing is mow high, mow often. I want you to repeat that. Mow high, mow often. So is that in your brain now? <laughs> OK. So what is mow high? If you have no idea what kind of grass is on your lawn, and most of us don't know, set it at two inches. The mower should be set at two inches, all right? If you know what it is, if you have a climax lawn, the bent grass likes to be cut close, lower. So it should be at 1 to 1.5 inches. And you have that information in your handout, so there's no need to write down all of this. And what's mow often? Weekly. Weekly during the growing period. And the growth, growing period has started. It's already warm out there. And they're starting to grow. Yeah. So, OK. So you know the rule for pruning. You do not cut off more than one third each time. And usually for pruning, it's one year. But for grass, it's each mow. So think of this. If the grass blade is two inches, and let's say that's bent grass, and we're going to mow it, ideally, we're not mowing more than, we're not cutting off with each mow every week more than a third of that two inches. Got that? All right. So remember to set the mower at the correct height and mow often, at least weekly. We want a thin trim of the grass, not drastic cut by half or so. The rest of the year, once a month. So it does not get too tall. OK, this is what happens. If you cut the grass too low, see what happens to the roots. It stunts the growth. So this is perennial rye. And the experiment shows consistent mowing at 2 inches high versus 1 versus half inch and what happens to the entire root system. Remember, the grass blades is where photosynthesis is taking place, and the food feeds the root growth. All right. Um, probably don't need to mention this. Keep your mower blades sharp, because otherwise we're tearing. 
instead of cutting. And also, it's good to use a mulching mower. If you can do that, you don't have to fertilize as often because those grass blades return nitrogen to your turf. And if you have wet clippings like you might have now, just go over it one more time and see if they will break up sufficiently. And if not, break it up and put it in the compost pile. OK, so what is thatch? Thatch is that wheat color layer between the green blades and the soil. And it's a mixture of living stuff and dead stuff. So it has some grass roots and it has some grass stems. Normally, there are microbes that will break down the thatch. So the thatch will never build up to an unhealthy thickness. However, if the grass is suffering from drought, stress, the soil pH is too low, too acidic, which in our area with the rain, they can easily get too acidic. Um, a number of conditions, if it's not ideal, can inhibit the microbes from working to break down the thatch. And that's how we end up with a thick layer of thatch buildup. So the problem with having a thick layer of thatch is new roots would grow there instead of going into the soil because it's so much easier, right? So those roots will be really vulnerable to drought. And that is a problem for keeping a good looking turf. One other thing to remember is soil compaction. If we always have the same mowing pattern, the wheels of the mower and our feet will compact the soil and eventually even form minor ruts. So remember, the recommendation is to change the mowing pattern every time you mow. Never walk the same path if you can remember that far back. All right, let's talk about fertilizing. If you have a bent grass lawn and you return the grass clipping, no need to add fertilizer. If you're an overachiever, you can go up to two times a year. All right, and we remember the perennial rye. That's a, a really lush looking grass. If the lawn is fairly new, it probably has a high percentage of perennial rye. It does like nitrogen. Otherwise, it'll get sickly easy. So two to four applications a year is the recommendation. And again, this is in your handout. So there is no need to write all of this down. Our recommendation is two, uh, two applications of fertilizer, one in the spring around mid-May and one in the fall, mid-September to mid-October. And this graph down below shows the rate of grass growth, the top growth, that's the green above the line. Okay, so you can see the majority of the growth. Your, your grass is growing the fastest from April to June, and then it actually goes into the summer stress, and it's not growing much anymore. It's kind of maintaining, which is why we have to mow a lot in the spring, and then in the summer we're not needing to mow as much because the grass is not growing so fast. All right, and then in the fall, there is another growth spur of your grass. So the spring adding fertilizer is helping to feed the top growth because that's what the plant is engineered to do. It's focusing on growing the top and some will help develop the roots. But in the fall, because temperatures are lower, there is not as much top growth and a greater proportion of the nutrient, the fertilizer, will be actually growing the roots. So spring fertilizer is helping to give a nice lush, thick green look to the lawn, and the fall fertilizer is helping to develop deeper, stronger roots. So next spring, when the growth period comes, we're gonna have great looking lawn because they have been fed, they have deeper roots, and remember the picture of the root depth versus the top growth. All right, so the, oh, I want to mention one thing. It says one to two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet uh, for each application. 
remember, remember it's one to two pounds of nitrogen, not one to two pounds of fertilizer. So you're going to have to look at the fertilizer you buy, see what the concentration of nitrogen is, which is always printed on the label, and you will have to do some conversion. And the OSU uh, publications actually give you an example of how to figure out the math. Okay. All right. So it's a personal choice whether you want to use organic or synthetic fertilizer. But the important thing is to pay attention to the analysis. And that's these numbers. On the right, it says 935 connected with dashes. And that's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And on the left, it says 333. And again, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Now, the Chances are, if you purchase a synthetic fertilizer, it's going to have higher concentrations, like the one on the left. And if you're purchasing an organic one, it's going to be a lower concentration. And the important thing is to read the label and figure out if the form of fertilizer you choose is water soluble. Because water soluble means with each watering of the lawn, the fertilizer breaks down, nutrient becomes immediate, immediately available to the grass. Well, that's good, also not so good. It's good because it's immediately available so the grass can start using it, right? It's not so good if we put all of our one to two pound per thousand square foot recommendation on all together because it's immediately available and chances are your turf cannot use all of it. And nitrogen is a very short-term fertilizer. The water-soluble form, if it's not used, it's lost. It'll go into the groundwater, it'll get washed away, so it's a waste of your money and it's potentially polluting our water. So pay attention to what is available and if it's water-soluble, the recommendation is to use a certain amount, what do we do? Break it up into three, four applications. Do it weekly. You know, do a third or a quarter each week. Spread it out. So that will maximize the percentage of your fertilizer using the grass, I mean, reaching the grass, so the grass will get the most benefit out of it. OK, watering. Basically, turf needs one inch of water a week. OK? During the summer, when we don't or hardly get any rain, it's one inch of water a week that we have to give them. In the spring and fall, when we do have rain, it's less. So if you want to be precise, you can measure how much rain comes down and hit your lawn and then make the adjustment, right? And you've heard of the tuna can layout in the, uh, see all the little tuna cans out there? <laughs> this, is a, uh, this is a scientist. Uh, we don't have to be so precise, but you know, we want a pretty good idea. And I think they're checking the different uh, systems to see the coverage. And because some areas will over, be over water and others will be under. All right. And people always ask when we talk about watering, well, how many times should I water? All right, so that's a really hard question to answer. And it's not because I'm not smart enough. You're not even laughing. <laughs> OK, so it's because it has to do with the kind of soil you have and how you water. So the thing we want to avoid in watering is too much water get on the surface, soil does not absorb it, and it runs off the surface, right? It's called runoff. We want to avoid that. So ideally, we're watering slow enough for the soil to absorb the water without runoff. And ideally, we water and allow the water to penetrate as deep as possible into the soil. Because remember, where water is, where the soil is moist, is where the roots will go to work. So if we break up our watering into one-seventh of an inch every day, and we're not getting the moisture down into the soil, our roots will just stay in the top where it's moist. 
Okay? So you have to experiment. Try watering in a way that you don't have runoff the longest you can to get to the one inch and use a screwdriver and poke a hole in the lawn and see the moisture zone. Check to see where the moisture is. And for um, a good root development, go for a one and a half foot to two feet. Okay, so if you can achieve that, just water once a week. You also have an option of just allowing your grass to go dormant in the summer. And they should bounce back in the fall, and you can do the repair job of the patch in the fall um, after the rain. And uh, just know that if you allow the grass to go dormant, they will become weaker, and the bare areas are more susceptible to weeds coming in. And now I'm talking about weeding. Uh, my time is up, but let me just say, a lot of folks use weed and feed products, which goes against what we're taught, integrated pest management, which is you know what the problem is before you prescribe a solution. And normally, the weed and feed product is fertilizing while it's doing something else, weed killing. If we don't know what weed it is and what is the best way to take care of it, it's a waste. And it is not good for the environment, pollinators, etc. So think twice about how we approach weeding and fertilizing. So this is what we have talked about. I'll be outside to answer any questions. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm.